Okay, alles klar. Sie sehen also diese hybriden Veranstaltungen live und online, das lernen wir. Hybrid, we Name, are Herren, still practicing. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm happy to welcome you here tonight in Berlin and in the stream. I'm Jörg Haas. I'm the speaker for international politics at the Heinrich Bell Foundation. And I'm very happy to welcome you to our event titled Feminist Economics, Economy by and for all. Now, this is a series of events dealing with the transformation of economic policy because we have to rethink economics. We need to transform economics in order to achieve our global climate goals and sustainability goals in general, which is what we have to do. Now, when trying to find a new a transformating economy, we want to listen to what eminent thinkers think. We had a number of people here already who presented their ideas in the course of this series. And tonight, we are happy to welcome Yayati Gosch, who will be in a conversation with Ricarda Lang. Emma Schultz, my new executive director, will introduce the speakers. But first, I would like to thank those who have made this event possible, Zara Ritterts my assistant and the whole conference team, the interpreters, the technicians, everybody who tries to make it work. Without all these people, nothing would happen here. So we would like to thank them. And now I would like to invite Ricarda Lang and Ime Scholz on stage. And I hope you will enjoy the evening. Good evening and a very warm welcome. From my side, Rashi, I'm happy to welcome you to you are online with us. You are actually in the United States, but I'm very happy to have you here with us tonight and about the fact that you will tell us about your perspective on feminist economics. Jayati is one of the globally leading experts in development economics, and she has offered lots of insights with respect to economics in terms of science, but also with respect to economic policy. So I guess we can learn a lot here in Germany from her feminist economics. That's one of the core issues of HBS of the Heinrich Bell Foundation. So I'm happy about the series, the program we are having here. I'm also very happy to welcome you, Ricarda. You used to be the spokeswoman for women's affairs in the Green Party, and you are now a member of the board. And you have also worked a lot on the coalition agreement. So I think this is a wonderful combination we are having here. But now I would like to give the floor to you, Jayati. We are listening. Yes. Uh, thank you so much. It's such a great pleasure to be here with you, even virtually. And I, I love the idea of you know my being in on the stage with you in some way, which is. Uh, making me feel that I'm still part of your event, uh, even though I'm not really uh, physically with you. And uh, a particular thanks to Jorg and Sarah, whom I have been interacting with in the past, and I, it's really very kind of them to invite me and to enable me uh, to be part of your discussions in Germany, because I think it's hugely important. I think uh, 
I'm really delighted that the HBF and the Green Party and, and all of you are taking this seriously because it's much too important uh, to be left in the hands of economists, as I, as I will mention. So very, very briefly, why is feminist economics as an approach so important? Why do I think that it is absolutely essential if we are really going to think of transforming our economies in a meaningful way? Well, let's put it this way. You know, we live in a world of disruption and I think many of us are tired of this disruption. We are exhausted by the continuous disruptions that do not seem to end. But there are some disruptions that are important and are positive. And in fact, we need these disruptions to be able to cope with all the other disruptions that we are facing in the world. Particularly, I think feminist economics has this power to disrupt and it's a positive disruption. It is something we should welcome. I think feminist economics is hugely disruptive for the discipline of economics. It's disruptive for the ways in which we think about the world around us and the world economy and the global architecture. And it's disruptive for economic policymaking. But these are all necessary disruptions. And we really have to embrace them and take them forward if we're ever going to be able to confront our challenges today. So let me identify some of the three major areas in which I think feminist economics is disruptive and how we should take that disruption, in, internalize it and go forth in terms of changing things. First, in terms of, if you like, the, the sort of micro foundations, the theoretical conceptual foundations of economics. Standard mainstream economics, as we know it today, is premised on the idea of what has been called possessive individualism, the idea that it's the individual and the utility maximization of the individual who will then possess the benefits of whatever transactions occur. And this is all done within the philosophical framework of rational economic man. Now, it's no surprise that it's rational economic man because in fact, this entire edifice completely ignores the very possibility of the care economy and of things that are done by people, by individuals, not necessarily for themselves. In other words, the whole premise of uh, this mainstream economics, the philosophical underpinnings of mainstream economics relies on the fact that people do things for their own utility and they maximize that utility subject to various constraints. The care economy is predicated on the idea that there are people who are doing things for others. They are doing things, whether it is social reproduction, looking after the young, bearing children, looking after them, looking after the elderly, looking after those who are differently abled, looking after people who, for whatever reason, cannot look after themselves. And without that, care economy, societies would not survive, economies would not survive. But the whole of economics ignores it. In other words, because it is not done for a monetary transaction or when it is not done for a monetary transaction, it's ignored. It's not economic activity. It's not valued. It doesn't enter GDP. It, it's okay that people do not get paid for it. It's, it's, but the economy relies on it. Now, once you bring that in, you re recognize that the economy is dependent on something which philosophically economics does not recognize, does not account for. And that changes so many things. It changes, of course, the philosophical and micro underpinnings of how we look at an economy, but it has massive macroeconomic implications. So the second big shift that transforms the discipline is in terms of macroeconomic approaches. You know, once we recognize that there is this whole, if you like, subterranean existence of care work, a large part of which is unpaid and also unrecognized, then it means that there is this care economy that is effectively subsidizing the recognized or formal economy. So a large part of what we see as the economy and which is then, you know, this God that we all have to worship and we have to subordinate all human uh, needs and freedoms and so on to this God, the altar of economic activity and keeping that going. Yet that economic activity is hugely reliant on this care economy, which is underground, which is subterranean, which is not 
welcomed or recognized or catered for in any fashion. Now, if you recognize this, then all kinds of things change. The fact that, you know, accumulation growth patterns are dependent on how exactly care is incorporated or not, and the gender relations that enable that growth. The fact that labor market segmentation occurs because there are so many people, mainly women, doing unpaid care work. And therefore, when they enter labor markets, their work is undervalued or less valued, even for formal employment. The fact that cyclical fluctuations in economies, economic cycles are cushioned by this unpaid care work, which can be pushed onto households. That then when governments engage in fiscal austerity, they can do that knowing that there is a household economy that will take care of a large part of that work, which has to be done anyway. It cannot be non-performed because societies will just stop existing if that work is not performed. The fact that international patterns of remittance flows or balance of payments, all of these things trade are affected by the, that gender construction of the economy, the care work that enters into that economy and how it is rewarded, recognized, remunerated or not. All of these also affect international processes. All of these things change, in other words, our analysis, our assessment of both micro and macroeconomics changes fundamentally once we recognize this basic fact of care work and the gender construction of that care work. Most economists, I mean, economic textbooks don't include this at all, but even most economists don't want to know about it. And there's another very big reason for that. And that is because of the huge impact this then has on policymaking. So you see the fact that all this exists, tends to be ignored by policymakers, and yet it plays a huge role in determining policies. So, you know, we as feminist economists, we used to say policies are gender blind. That's not true, they're not. In fact, I now realize fundamentally that these are not gender blind policies of governments and states. They are gender exploitative policies. Governments know this. The governments know this just as much as I do or that many of us do in this room. They exploit that gender construction of society to enable getting things done on the cheap. So a lot of the fiscal austerity measures that governments routinely promote are done in the knowledge that a lot of this social reproduction, a lot of this care work is going to happen anyway. It's going to be done because societies will not function without it because women who are dominantly charged with doing that care work, especially in unpaid work within families and households, women will do it because they care about the people whom they're supposed to care for. So if it's not provided by care services, if it's not provided by the public sector, if they cannot afford to do it by paying for it through private providers, women will provide it in unpaid care work within their households through additional burdens on themselves, because you cannot let that not happen. You will not let a newborn infant go without care. You will not let an elderly family, uh, member of your family go without care because of that emotional bond as well. And governments know this. Governments rely on this to make cutting down on particular social sectors one of the easiest things to do whenever they feel that there is a need for belt tightening. And governments therefore make austerity one of the planks on which they see that they should be viable and acceptable to financial markets, which are therefore given precedence over the human rights of citizens, the social and economic rights of citizens because of the assumption that this will be taken care of by households, by unpaid workers within families. How do we change this? We change this once we recognize that it's not about being gender blind. It's not about being gender neutral. That all of this is a reflection of power imbalances within our societies, but also and hugely within our economies. To change that power balance, we really have to be, as I said, gender aware, but also therefore aware of the disruptive power of feminist economics. So it's only by using that 
disruptive uh, power of fem feminist economics by showing how that plays out in terms of unpaid labor, but therefore also in terms of how it plays out in labor markets, how it pay plays out in patterns of growth and accumulation, how it plays out in fiscal and monetary strategies, how it plays out in international economic relations. It's only by doing that that we will be able to force changes in economic policy and in economic international architecture that can actually allow us to cope with the major challenges of our time. I can actually talk about how everything is inter interrelated, about how democratizing and understanding the nature of work will then lead into democratizing humans' ability to cope with climate change, the nature of survival of our planet, humans' ability to address all the different dimensions of inequality, how democratizing our understanding of work also plays into our democratizing societies as a whole. But I think these are discussions that possibly we will have in much more detail uh, in what follows. So let me just stop here with these introductory remarks. Thank you. Uh, I have to speak German, excuse me. So thank you very much, Tayati, for this uh, view on the economic sector, on the point of view of unpaid work and the gender construct and the power asymmetry that lies behind it and what it means for our economic and uh, policy instruments should be dealt with in our discussion later on. But first of all, Ricarda, I would like to ask you to react to it, to comment what we've just heard. So do you agree or do you um, have a different perspective? What would you say? Oh, hello. Good evening. It's a great honor to be here with you tonight and also with you, Emma. It's difficult to speak German now, but I hope that it is going to work throughout the debate. And um, many items that you've touched upon, I can only fully agree to it because what we have um, laid out as our basis as the Greens in our founding times or also last year, we said we need a feminist um, federal government. And this is actually the basic principle, which means that feminism is not one topic which uh, is being uh, dealt with alongside uh, economics or labor market policy, but it's a, an objective. Um, the objective to equally share resources and power and uh, to allow a self-determined life for everyone and that this perspective needs to be applied to every area in society, a feminist foreign policy, a feminist transportation policy, and also a feminist economic policy. This is what we need. And in the field of economics, I think this applies in particular because you just mentioned it. It is about a distribution of power, equal distribution of power. And this is also being decided upon through economic structures, in particular in our societies. So this is why I'm convinced, and I think this is also what we see today. I mean, when you look at the history of women's movements of emancipation, then in many areas where it was about formal discrimination or formal uh, equality, we have made a lot of progress. For example, rape in marriage um, is now uh, banned. And uh, also the question, what we, what are we allowed to do as women? So we have made a lot of headway here, a lot of progress. And when we look at the US, uh, the attempt to overthrow Roe versus Wade, this has all, all been fought for. But this is nothing that we should take for granted. We always have to defend it. But when we take a look at where we stand when it comes to uh, equal treatment or equal access to information, informal structures, power structures in our society, then we see a different picture. We see that we have a huge gender pay gap. We see that women in particular are affected by old age and poverty. Um, so it's not only about the formal rights, what I'm allowed to do, but it's also about the question, how is our society structured? And here we have to catch up a lot still. 
And this is why the view to the economy um, and economics is so important, because a feminist perspective, a feminist view can lead to a more human-centered perspective of the economy. Because in the end, and this is also um, something that you brought up in the beginning, um, the, the basic decision is whether we consider an economy, an individual identity, which has its own uh, rules of play, which the society cannot change. So this would actually be the opinion of Hayek. So the society would actually be subordinate to the economy. And we have to understand what makes sense in the market. And there's this so-called invisible hand of the market. Or if the economy serves the people. Shouldn't we define how we want to live as society? What do we want to achieve as society? What are our objectives? And then we have to think about economic structures and how they need to be shaped in order to fulfill that. And the feminist perspective brings this aspect into the debate to say we want to live in a society with equal rights in a participatory society and then we have to think about the shaping of economic structures so that these structures come up to our demands and I would just briefly like to touch upon some items because uh, otherwise we could discuss here for a week but I would like to confine myself to three aspects that you also mentioned and which are very relevant for the debate one thing is the distinction between unpaid and paid work, which always goes along with a topic which has been very important for the feminist movement, which is the division in the, into the official and the private sphere. So certain work takes place in the public sphere and is recognized as labor, whereas other uh, labor unpaid labor is not recognized. So care work, the care for elderly, for children, child rearing. So this is the unpaid work, and this is not really regulated. So the state does not want to regulate it. But at the same time, and I think this has become clear, um, is also very reliant on it to happen. So the women's strikes have shown it last year. And the moment that this work is no longer done, the whole field of paid work will actually crumble, will no longer function. So this, this unpaid work is actually an invisible basic precondition, prerequisite, a fundament. But as it's not really regulated, it's just left to the individual and these structures are rather being neglected or denied. And from a political point of view, the question is not very easy. I do not have the perfect answers for it. But two years ago, I think we had our Women's Conference of the Greens here. And we had another feminist economist, um, Ms. Federici, who joined us from the US uh, at the time. And she conducted a campaign payment for care work, for this unpaid work. Um, I have made doubts about this. This could also lead to a situation where this individualization is perpetuated. So this so far unpaid work might be paid. But the question is, how do we deal with it as a, situ uh, as a society? How do we approach uh, child work, care work, reproductive work? Might this not lead to a situation where women are even more strongly confined to this private sphere? And this is a discussion that we have to conduct. The second aspect is, what do we understand when we talk about wealth or well-being? So wealth, in the sense of a classic economy, is based on the gross domestic product. Then, of course, only paid work is relevant. Only the, the amount of work that has been provided and how much you pay for it is relevant. But then, of course, I neglect the question of unpaid work, of care work. So when we change our view on the economy or want to change it, then, of course, we also have to redefine wealth. 
and the question of a participatory of a society, of an equal society uh, and sustainability need to be our guiding principles. So the question is how should the future of our society look like? And then, of course, we have to think about um, to how to transfer it into the economic structures and into care work. Um, etc. And the last item is time, the aspect of time. You already brought it up. You said time poverty. So much of these issues is dependent on who has time for it, how is time distributed in society. And if or a feminist perspective changes the way we understand an economy, but an economic perspective also changes our view of feminism because there's also a, a movement in the women movements who say women just need to be more closely integrated into the uh, official um, economy, official market, and they need to be paid more. Of course, yes, but the question is, whether it's our objective to achieve a model which is based on this sole bread earner um, model, so one person um, has a full-time job and the other uh, partner stays at home and takes care of the household and the children. So if the objective is that women also should work 40 hours per week, then that usually has two effects. Either this unpaid work needs to be taken care of on top, risking a burnout due to the high burden, or this work is outsourced. And when the work is outsourced, this is what we see. Then usually this is outsourced to poorer women, usually to migrant women. And this cannot be the solution when we talk about real uh, equity and feminism. So I think that working times and reduction of working times is something that we have to deal with when we take feminist economy seriously. And maybe a final remark, I already mentioned it at the beginning. The economy will change when we enter a feminist perspective, of course. And similar to many other areas, we will also achieve better economic structures for society as a whole. This is what we see, for example, in the transportation policy. When we take a feminist view, then structures become more accessible for different groups of people. And the same holds true for the feminist economy, that overall we have to come to a more sustainable economy. You brought up the issue of climate change, uh, more an emancipatory and more democratic economy. And this is why I'm really looking forward to discussing with you tonight about all these issues. Thank you very much, Ricarda. This was a very committed uh, talk, very committed speech, which picked up many different aspects. And I saw Jayati, who listened to you very carefully, and I'm sure she would like to react to it as well. But I would like to ask you first, you also brought up democracy and uh, time management, time economy, and that a feminist economy should not mean that women are doing the same thing as men. And you, Jayati, talked about democratization of labor. And this is a term that we only very rarely hear in Germany. So what's your understanding? What's your take on it? You said that you could elaborate on it. Um, it might be quite fitting to what uh, Ricarda just said. Yes, thank you so much. And thank you so much, Ricarda, for that really uh, inspiring intervention. It's so delightful to know that there are people who are in positions of policy making who can actually uh, try and take some of these things forward. So I was really very enthused to hear you. I, I, I'd like to take up two of the things that, that uh, came up. One is the whole issue of you know, what do we do about it? And I completely agree with you, Ricardo. The, Ricardo, this idea that you have to just pay women for housework, that's not a solution. That's not the way to go. I think, uh, particularly with regard to care work, uh, there is the 5R framework. It began with Diane Elson, the feminist economist from England, talking about three Rs. 
and it has then been developed into five Rs, which the ILO has also now accepted, the International Labour Organization has also accepted. So what are the five Rs? The first is to recognize all of this care work, recognize the paid and the unpaid care work, which means also doing the time use surveys to know how much people are doing in different ways. Mm -hmm. And these time use for surveys have to be done in every country periodically, but actually not by just asking people, what did you do, but following them around. Because we now know that women tend to even underestimate their own work. They don't even count the times when they're doing multiple tasks. They don't, then sometimes we are not even aware of all the things we have done even in the previous day. So recognize how much work there is by just actually doing proper time use surveys. Second, then reduce the unpaid part as much as possible. And there are many ways of reducing this unpaid work. In India, women spend many hours collecting fuel, wood, collecting water. And a lot of that can be reduced by making available these public amenities. Uh, there are many other types of unpaid work, the drudgery of which you can reduce through public policy that is oriented to that. But governments don't bother because they don't see it as a cost. Some, you know, it's, big, it's a cost borne by households and by women and girls within households. So reduce as much as possible. Once you've identified a lot of that work, you can think of these strategies that would involve reducing the unpaid part. The other part of reducing is to redistribute. So that's the third R, to redistribute this unpaid work between households, communities, private providers, and public providers. And of course, the public has to play a very important role in this. So the public sector has to come in and provide essential care services for children, for elderly people, this is the one about elderly care is going to become more and more important, I assure you. Uh, different kinds of care, therapy for trauma. And now we have many different kinds of trauma as well. Not just the traumas that come in the regular course of life or for people who have different psychological needs, but traumas that come from shocks, traumas that come from people who have to, are forced to become refugees, whether for war or climate change traumas that come from dealing with a whole new different kind of situation. We saw a lot of that in the COVID context, for example. So significant redistribution of different kinds of care with a large role played by the public sector and public investment in care, but also enabling private provision because we know that governments can't always deal with all of these things or public provision cannot deal with it. So provide child support grants, provide other means, elderly care grants that enable people to access flexibly private care wherever required and provide community services, provide uh, care cooperatives. In many parts of Europe, I know that these are being developed and thought of. So provide different types of care, redistribute that care work. And of course, whatever remains to try and redistribute that within families. I'm sure everyone here, it's interesting that it's dominantly women, right? We all know how difficult that is to redistribute within our families. But again, that also is something that you have to do by, by getting people from children onwards, school onwards, to encourage that notion that it's not biological. It's not that women have to do everything. All women have to do is carry those babies and deliver them biologically, there's nothing else that is biological. And therefore, you know, this whole idea of redistributing, I think is something that we have to deal with at all of these levels. The, th the fourth R is that when you are then making sure that public sector, private sector, governments, communities are doing some of that care work, we reward care workers properly. We respect them, we reward them, we treat them with dignity. We make sure they have good working conditions. We make sure they have good wages. We make sure that their work, which is a lot of which is skilled work, is recognized to be skilled. You know, at the moment, it's assumed that early childhood education or looking after the elderly, these are all unskilled things anyone can do. That's not true. These are really very skilled activities. They require specialized learning. So we should be training people to do this. We should be rewarding them adequately. We should be recognizing and respecting the huge contribution they make to society. At the moment, care workers 
are supposedly in, in official productivity terms, they are seen as the least productive workers. And the workers in finance, in Goldman Sachs or JP Morgan, they are the most productive workers. That's nonsense. Socially, we know that these are the most important workers in society. And those guys in finance are actually the worst. They are creating more problems than they are solving anything. So we really have to put all of that on its head and reward care workers adequately. And the final R is to represent, to represent care workers, to give care workers themselves a voice in the policies that affect them. And that means both the paid and the unpaid care workers. So really, you know, in terms of a strategy of, for dealing with care work, it's not a solution to say, oh, let's have a salary for housewives. That's the worst option, because first of all, that's reinforcing gender stereotypes. And secondly, it's not solving the problem in a way that is holistic. So I really think the five hours is what we should be campaigning for in terms of dealing with it. The other point I would like to take up is time poverty, but maybe I've talked too much and I can come back to that. das ruhig auch noch sagen, oder? Also bitte, ähm, den, den zweiten Punkt über Zeitarmut, den würden wir doch gerne noch hören. Bitte. Um, that was not translated, so I'm not sure what you said, but... Uh... Actually, sorry, the interpreter was in the wrong channel. Um, she said, oh. you should actually tell us the second aspect you wanted okay. to mention, please. Okay, right. Yes, got it. Thank you. Yes, so yeah, about time poverty, I'm so glad that uh, you raised that point because, you know, one of the things about time poverty that we don't realize is that it's bad, obviously, for the person who is time poor, but it actually also adds to material poverty. It's a double whammy. It's not just that you have less time, but it is that then the goods and services you can provide in that smaller time are less quality than they would be otherwise. Let me try and explain this a little bit more. Compare, uh, you know, two households, both of which earn, let's say, I don't know, 5,000 euro per month, okay? In one household, there is a man earning 1,000 euro, uh, 5,000 euro per month with a wife who is staying at home, looking after the family, not engaged in outside work. And a family where it's also 5,000 euro per month, but it's a husband and wife, both of whom work outside. The husband gets 3,000, the wife gets 2,000, which is actually the kind of average wage difference there is, okay? But both of them have to go out, work long hours. Maybe they, they have to leave the house at 7.30 a.m. to commute, and then they get back home only by about 7, 7.30 p.m., both of them, okay? Now, the woman, typically, we know, the woman is the one who's going to end up cooking, cleaning, making sure the kids are ready, making sure they have their lunch boxes, making sure they have their baths, making sure they get to sleep on time. The woman is going to be doing all that. The quality of the goods and services she can provide her children when she's working outside as well is much worse, right? So it's not just that she is overworked and she is desperate and she has that double burden, but also her children, her family will also get worse quality food, worse quality care, worse quality looking after, all of those things. Whereas in the other case, it is the wrong gender division of labor, it's unfort, et cetera, but those children and, and so on will get better quality. So time poverty has a further implication. It's not just a much worse quality of life for the woman who is time poor. It is a worse material conditions for that whole family. We never consider that when we look at poverty data. When we look at income data, we never look at the quality of unpaid goods and services that those families get. And so we don't even realize that the families in which there are time poor adults and especially time poor women are also poor even beyond their income. And that's a very important policy thing that we have to take into account, which we don't because we are not conscious of time poverty. It's never even recognized in official policy documents. It's not there in most of the assessments of people's material living standards. You look at all the OECD or the Europa data, not once is time poverty mentioned or even calculated.
Ich denke, viel von den fünf R, die, die uh, Jayati dargestellt hat, the five R's you've mentioned, Jayati, well, we, we experienced it in the corona pandemic. The unbalanced, the imbalance, and the overall problem in families, in society. And I mean, there were lots of promises made, and there was a lot of applause in those two years of COVID. However, not much has happened, and apparently it's not possible to pay more for care or other such services. And if there is additional capital, the money is made available to the health insurances. So the question is, if there is extra money, who gets it? And the same goes for education. I mean, the recognition of your training, of your education, and is it being reflected in your income? But a lot of what you say, Dayati, implies that when it comes to public services and the social security and trade unions and all these aspects we connect mentally, so to speak, with the 20th century have to be revisited. I mean, the neoliberal policy is actually what we are being faced with, and we do realize that this is not modern at all. And I mean, there was a lot of resistance in the past because of the imbalance and inequality it triggers. Now, Ricarda, I mentioned the coalition agreement. And, and of course, it may be a bit difficult for me to ask you to criticize the coalition agreement, which you co-authored yourself. But uh, you might still tell me where you do see the biggest leverage. Well, no, of course, I can tell you where good things are to be found in the coalition agreement and where things are not that good. I mean, you all know that this is a compromise. It's um, three parties that have come together in order to agree on a political coalition. And of course, this requires compromises. Now, the exciting bit, and certainly you have heard it, we try to not focus on the policy of the smallest common denominator, meaning that you find aspects which are real projects supported by the Green Party, which, of course, implies that the other parties could also go for their favorite projects. Now, when people ask me what my favorite agreement was, and people tend to think that I will say, well, we could not impose the idea of a speed limit on motorways on the other parties. But I normally say it's um, the extension of mini jobs. Now, the five R's, that's truly an exciting approach. And it has me think, what are the projects we still have to focus on? I mean recognize we are doing quite well. I think in this field, Lisa Paus, the current Minister for Families, is very much focusing on this question, like the invisibility of the impact of certain political measures for the sexes needs to be considered. In other words, we really need to focus on gender budgeting. We need to see what the respective budget means for which gender. I mean, the corona policy in Germany 
the money was given to industries where lots of men work, whereas there were women mostly work. There was a lot of applause and praise, but no money. So once again, the men were on stage, whereas the women were praised for, once again, carrying the double burden, working, having a job, and taking care of household and families. And this has an impact for society as a whole. I think more equal societies are more resilient societies. And we do need resilience, because this, these are times which are characterized by crises. My political generation has grown up with crises. And we are very far from solving those crises. We are even witnessing a war, but I think a more just society, a society with more equality is a more resilient one. And then the question of access, that's also an important question. So what is being asked publicly and what is being facilitated publicly? And this is about child care and care for sick people and the elderly. And of course, it's not necessarily bad to take it out of the family context. I mean, I've grown up in southern Germany in the countryside, and people tend to, tend, tend to think that if you if you send your grandma to an old age care home, you just try to get rid of her, right? So it's also key to have those homes or kindergartens of a good quality, which is also connected to the question of the reward. I mean, this is clearly about distributing money. The question is, what do we pay for? How much do we pay? And who earns money? How and where? Let me give you an example. In the coalition agreement, we agreed to revise the funding of the health care system in Germany. I mean, Germany spends quite a lot of money on health care and the argument many people mention, according to which we have saved so much money in the sector so that it was killed is not true. I mean, we do have lots of private homes and clinics and hospitals. And I mean, the people who work there don't get much money, and we are all to be blamed for it, i.e., a better pay for PTs, for the care workers, for all those sectors where more women work. But this can only work if we have a redistribution of the money. So it needs to be a priority. Redistribute. Here again, the public sector is very important, but also the question, how do we um, share within the family? And we do have a lot concerning this question in our coalition agreement, like a better protection for mothers, which is meant to be a protection for partners in the Zukunft. In other words, the fathers, too, should get the opportunity of um, taking days off right after the birth of a child without suffering any deduction from the salary. So we do see lots of important aspects. In order to enable processes or facilitate things, but we do need, of course, the redistribution in order to finance this field. And I think all in all, the most important question is the question of less working 
time and there are different ways we can use like we could go and pass a law and we can say people who work in the field of care should not work more than 32 hours a week i mean there are lots of people who quit because it was just too hard and then we do have collective bargaining agreements last week i was at a verdi trade union meeting in Münster. This was about a collective agreement um, for people who, if they worked over time, were to be granted relief points, so to speak. So quite a bit is moving in this field, also in the field of um, the trade unions. They also have learned a lot in the recent past, and I'm quite proud of being a member of this trade union. But here, too, if we want to be relevant in the future, we need to discuss the question of unpaid labor and the importance of care. This is to be part of the analysis. And that the last question in this context would be who co-decides concerning these measures. I mean, in the corona pandemic time, the question was often who writes the experts' opinions, right? I mean, there were lots of studies published, important studies by important universities, but the word woman did not even show up. And this happens if you don't have women involved, if everybody is sitting at the table and there are no women. And this is also a question of democracy. I mean, when we talk about parity in parliaments, I mean, women are not better human beings or better politicians. Marine Le Pen is an excellent example to show that there are also women who are very, very distanced from any feminist future. But we are talking about democracy. Democracy implies equal participation and all perspectives need to be at the table, which means you have to have women at the tables where the people sit who take the decisions. Right now, I don't think we have a feminist federal government, but it makes a difference to have at least a few more women in the ministries, right? This is true. Thank you, Ricarda. Um, I would like to ask you a question, Jayati, because Ricarda just said it makes a difference whether ministers themselves say feminism also offers a positive answer to the questions of our time. And we just talked about it today. We said it's a great opportunity to de tabooize, so to speak, uh, feminism. So feminism, feminism has been a taboo for quite some time, and we can withdraw that. We have a foreign minister who says she wants to conduct a feminist foreign policy, but we also have a development minister who says she wants to conduct a feminist development policy. So I would like to ask you, Jayati, is this something that is possible from your point of view? What would a feminist development policy look like? Because you're also a development economist. Oh, absolutely. And you know, fit? I think uh, so much of what you said is so uh, inspiring also because it shows what you can do when there are enough women out there. You know, it's so I am such a big really a believer in actually reservation in representation of women because one or two women in a very largely male space can't really make that difference. You need enough warm bodies. You need enough numbers there to actually be able to raise your voices, whether it's parliament or it is at the cabinet or it's within a ministry or it's within an organization. So the very fact that there are enough women who can then make that into a broader, more general thing, I think that is huge. And I, if you look, for example, at Chile, the very fact that that idea that you have to have half the women, half of cabinet is women at minimum, changes the perspective in so many different ways. 
In terms of the feminist development policy, you know, once again, there are so many different ways in which this plays out that uh, policymakers don't think about or are not aware because their own life circumstances have never led them to experience that particular condition. I'm thinking, for example, of migration policy, you know, whether it is the sending or the receiving countries, officially gender blind, but actually means gender oppressive. Uh, whether in terms of, you know, the assumption of the male breadwinner model that underlies a lot of it, even though we know more and more women are migrants for work in what has become a global value chain of the care economy. Uh, the, uh, the way in which the aid budgets, whatever they are, are distributed in terms of specific types of activities and infrastructure without regard to what they are implying either for the living conditions of everybody, especially women, or the working conditions, including unpaid work. You know, the fact that you don't prioritize, for example, access to clean water within households as one of the more, more important things, because it's all going to be carried anyway by women, you know, bringing water on buckets from their household, uh, from the water source to the household. All of these things, there is so much that would be affected once you actually have a feminist perspective. And the fact that it's no longer something to be scared of is huge. <laughs> that you don't have to say, oh, I'm not a feminist, but that you can now say, yes, I'm a feminist, which means the following things, which means recognizing not just equality of opportunity, but equal access to all of the conditions that make life worth living and a recognition of the time imbalances and the power imbalances that condition people's everyday life and then therefore influence their, their work life, their other lives and the broader relations of power. I think that's huge. So yes, absolutely, you can have a feminist, all of these things, just like you can have a socialist, all of these things. And in fact, I think the two go together. You can't have one without the other. So uh, I'm delighted that there are women in the German government. It's hard to think of I mean, where I'm coming from in India. We have such a long way to go in this. Uh, but it, it's delightful to know that it can happen. And it's, a, I think, a sign to all of us that we can all, in different parts of the world, hope for getting these changes. Thank you very much. Now I would like to open up the discussion to the audience and uh, you can ask questions or uh, comment what you've just heard. Oh, we already have a raised hand. Uh, so I have... I think it would be better okay, if you would speak German. I've got a question per person. I can vary, but I will start with Ricarda Lang in German. So don't worry, I wrote it down. This is why I have to look down on my notebook. I'm sure that you have already thought that this question might come up. When you say that feminism should uh, impact all different areas in politics, but my question now is how 100 billion euro can be, can be made available for the federal armed forces. I mean, I don't have to tell you where money is missing, where we lack money, you all know that. But what's the feminist aspect of spending this money for the German armed forces and also to fix or lay this down in the German basic law? Do you want me to answer directly? Okay. Of course, this is a question that is very important. Of course, the basic question, what does feminist foreign policy mean, for example, with a view to Ukraine, is not easy to answer. On the one hand, feminist foreign policy has the objective to reduce military violence and also to disarm. But on the other hand, we do see that staying out of conflict this would mean, in particular in Ukraine, that women are being raped, that are being um, faced with violence, that their right of self-defense is being taken away from them. So from a feminist point of view, of course, we can discuss this, but these are questions that, in particular, among those who um, support feminist foreign policy, 
need to discuss that. And we have to deliver weapons in order to support the right to self-defense of Ukraine. But at the same time, you brought up this special fund of 100 billion euros. I do believe in this special fund. This is not feminist policy, of course. But what I think makes sense, and this is the question of uh, laying it down in the basic law in Germany, this means that this will not be part of the debt break. Would we do it differently and say as a government and in many other areas it makes sense to spend more money? If we would just do it in our ongoing budget, then de facto this would actually be in competition to other expenditure. This means that we would then spend less on education, less on social affairs. So this would mean direct competition between the armed forces and other areas. And this would be way more detrimental. And this is why I think this um, idea with the basic law makes sense. And we as Greens have also made clear that this narrowed view that this is the only answer is not sufficient. Of course, we also have to think about um, restructuring of the German security policy. This, we will not only spend this, these 100 billion um, for the German armed forces. We have to restructure many things. Of course, in a feminist foreign policy, develop development cooperation plays a role, or conflict prevention, who participates in peace negotiations, for example. And this also plays into climate protection and resource conflicts. How can we prevent resource conflicts, conflicts in the future? Because we see that dependencies, for example, on fossil fuels will always make us dependent on authoritarian regimes. And these authoritarian regimes um, are now Qatar, for example. So it replaces Russia, but this cannot be the answer in the long run because the regime also um, limits women's rights. It cannot be a partner when it comes to a feminist foreign policy or feminist world. So this is why I think that the dependency on fossil fuels always poses a security risk and always poses the risk of uh, or risk for women's rights on feminist rights. So this is why I think climate protection, independence from fossil fuels, this is a major issue and also a feminist issue. So in the end, it is about an enhanced security uh, idea, which includes resilience, economic independence, and also climate protection. Thank you. And now the second question to Jayati. I can ask the question in English directly. Uh, so when you uh, gave your first presentation, you said that, um, that government representatives are very aware of gender exploitation and that they're consciously furthering it. And I just... I was wondering why you're so sure that it's a conscious choice, because what you were describing, it sounded more materialistic to me and more like a subconscious um, effect that is really, really ingrained in our way of politics, but not like something that um, individual politicians are choosing because they hate women. It's not the sense that you know, they are actively saying, let us think of more ways in which we can exploit women. I think it is effectively, yes, it's a subconscious, but it's a very, very deep and overriding principle in most governments that they know they can do this. They know you can get away with it because these activities are going to be performed anyway. At great cost to the women who do it with unpaid labor and with you know stretching themselves, their households, reducing the quality, but it will still get done. And I think it's that knowledge. In other words, yes, it's not that they are actively out there saying we will exploit women, but it is the ability of government policy to exploit this power imbalance and contradiction at the heart of the care economy that women ultimately will not withdraw care. Is exploited by government policy, and it comes out in in many many different ways, but particularly the connection is very important. also something which is urgent. Suddenly, there's a special fund, but there is no special fund to ensure that you know, care work 
does not take, uh, have to be borne the burden of it is, is taken up by women. You know, so I Jayati, we can't understand you at the moment. Um, the connection is very bad. The connection is very bad at the moment. We can hardly understand you. I think your oh. bandwidth seems to be insufficient. Could you repeat just a sentence? Yes, certainly. Uh, now it's will better. it help if I turn off the video now? Or uh, can you hear me now? Maybe, maybe turn off the video, but we can hear you okay, okay now. All right, I'm, I'm just going to say this and uh, then I will turn on the video again after I have spoken. I think I was not saying that there is a conscious attempt to exploit women or the gender relation on the part of governments, but it is a subconscious, yes, if you like, but an implicit awareness of the existence of gender imbalances and of this peculiar notion, uh, this peculiar contradiction at the heart of care, which is that ultimately care will not be withdrawn. Women will do that care work. And that knowledge is what enables governments to behave in ways that ultimately do exploit women. Whether it is cutting back on certain resources or not investing in those resources in the first place. There's a special fund suddenly when it comes to a war. There is no special fund to ensure that the kinds of excess burdens that came with COVID are fully accounted for or that the burdens of unpaid work are reduced. So I think it's that knowledge which is, in a say, way, what contributes to the fact that government's behavior and policies are gender exploitative. It's not that they are consciously exploiting, but that they are fully able to exploit that, that deep contradiction and the fact that it, the burden will be borne by households. I also just want to comment a little bit, I think, on uh, the excellent points Ricarda made which show that you know everything is interconnected, really. You can't be feminist without being socialist, without being green. And that there will be always these contradictions playing out. When it comes to foreign policy, therefore, also, I think it's hugely important for green feminists in Germany to be demanding also that their governments play a much better role in climate finance. The German government has not kept to its obligations, even to what they promised in 2012. Whereas suddenly you have, you know, billions and billions, you have hundreds of billions of dollars to fight a war. You don't have even $10 billion to give to COVAX for vaccine relief in Africa, where, you know, 20% of the population is vaccinated. You don't have money to give for ensuring that other kinds of climate finance that developing countries desperately need are met. In other words, you know, that contradiction also has to be resolved. Danke, das ist auch ein wichtiger Aspekt. Thank you very much. This is also a very important aspect. And tomorrow we will have the final session at the German Bundestag. We will talk about the budget of the development ministry and also climate funding. Further comments or questions? Can I, can I just make one final point and a plea? The German government has been resisting every attempt of developing countries to waive the TRIPS agreement for the COVID-19 diagnostics, vaccines, and things. The German government has been one of the most important governments. France and Germany and Switzerland are blocking the TRIPS waiver. This is now being considered in the WTO. Surely, surely, the Green Party, the all of you, everybody should be demanding that the German government supports a TRIPS waiver. I can uh, reply to that. I mean, I want to be honest. We could not uh, put this into the coalition agreement. We could not self-assert us here. But I fully agree to what you said. I share your view. This is also a question in, that we can look at from two sides. If we want to overcome the pandemic, the corona, then of course we have a joint interest to 
achieve a global vaccination status. Of course, this is also a question of global justice. The development that we do see at the moment in Europe and Europe versus Russia and a oil, gas, coal embargo, all this will have a massive impact on the whole world. When we say in Germany that we have to diversify now in terms of our power generation, then of course this will only work out if we can buy a lot at a global scale at relatively high prices. And of course, this will lead to a worse economic situation for many for other countries who are in a worse uh, economic situation. And the question is, what can we do? I mean, we have to uh, invest into climate protection, development, cooperation, etc. And Russia is already saying right now, well, uh, now these countries uh, are worsening the situation for you, and we, the Russians, and China are the ones who will help us, the development countries. So these are actually discussions that we have in the federal government, I have to admit. But I, of course, fully agree to the TRIPS waiver and also the uh, cooperation with developing countries. Thank you very much. Now Ines, and then over there. Oh, hello. Thank you very much for the interesting discussion. My name is Ines Kappert, and I'm the head of the feminist think tank of the Heinrich Böll Foundation, the Gunder Werner Institute. And I wanted to ask you, Jayat, as well as you, Ricarda, uh, for feminist strategies, because you have nicely described the problems and also the uh, objections. But what now? What are possibilities in this highly complex world, armament, global armament, redistribution of funds towards armament and not towards care work of, or unpaid work? So what are the current feminist strategies in order to achieve a redistribution and to start a discourse on redistribution? So what are your main arguments here? Jayati, would you like to start? Yes, sure. Can you hear me clearly, or yeah, should I turn yeah. off my video? We can hear you fine. Very okay, good. Okay, great. Yes, so Ines, that's a very important and good question, because as we know, every time we think we can make some progress, something else happens, and it, everything goes back. We step back many <laughs> steps, and we're pushed back further. And currently, the Ukraine war definitely has... Uh, been a major pushback in that sense in terms of diverting public resources, but also creating a global inflation, which, by the way, is intensified by profiteering and speculation. I really want to emphasize this. It's not the war alone. It is not the supplies from Russia and Ukraine alone. It is private companies, global agribusinesses profiteering, and it is fuel companies profiteering, and it is financial speculation. In the Paris and German uh, futures markets for commodities, 72% of the activity in April was financial funds. So it, a lot of it is also that. We can change some of that with regulation and we must demand that. So going back to the issue of how everything is interconnected, you know, we, we, all the time we should, we, we keep reacting. We keep saying, okay, this is the little money that is left for us. And so let us now see how we can use that money in a good way for women. That's not how we should be doing this. When it comes to the other side, they are very clear. We need this money. You provide it right now. We are always hesitant. We're always saying, oh, all right. We don't have enough money out of this budget. Let's take this little bit. Why are we not saying, why are you not taxing the rich? Why is the top 1% tripling its income over the pandemic. And yet there is no even solidarity tax, forget a wealth tax on their, those incomes or on that, those assets. Why are we still not demanding that we have a register of beneficial ownership of all wealth? So we know who is collecting the wealth where, and we can then proceed to tax that just the same way that all of us are taxed. Why are we not demanding a proper taxation of multinationals so that they can pay the same tax that local companies pay? Again, something that was thwarted in the OECD by the G7 countries. 
by the European countries in particular, who went in with their corporate multinational lobbies to prevent the fair taxation of the multinational corporations who pay average 4% tax on their profits compared to the 20, 25% that the local companies have to pay. These are all things which are also feminist issues because if you do not get those resources, then we get uh, told there's no money, you have to learn to live with those crumbs. So all of these, we have to form, form coalitions. If we do want a proper feminist strategy, we obviously have to increase our tax revenues of the states, which means we have to form coalitions with global tax justice movements, with others who are demanding similar things. We have to make large coalitions of people who will demand more resources for the public and then an appropriate redistribution of those resources, which includes these demands of ours for much better funded public services, for much more public investment in care. This is also something that actually impacts on employment because care we know, care and creative industries are the two activities that will be helped by technological change, not destroyed. A lot of manufacturing jobs will go, but care jobs can only increase if we demand proper levels of care and proper skilled uh, remuneration of care work. So definitely we need much more widespread demands for public investment in all of these activities and raising of those public revenues through ways that we know are possible and feasible, but are just politically not seen as acceptable. Thank you for the question, and I guess I can follow up with respect to many different points. Like, we can change our perspective with respect to politics. I mean, if feminism is but one theme among many others, policy as a whole is not seen or thought from a feminist perspective. So we always have to catch up if this is the situation. And of course, it's a lot of work to do away with inequalities once they have appeared or been formed. So it's much better to do it right away. And on the other hand, we know that policy instruments alone don't suffice, but we don't have the political majority we need in order to implement what we want to implement. We need pressure. We need to exercise pressure. And we need to convince people. So like in the climate movement, we need a social, a societal debate, actually. I mean, in the field of climate policy, we saw that this pressure and the overall societal debate have helped. There are three aspects. We need to see in the context of decision making, I say, A, we need to consider the life realities of the people. There are, of course, movements, right wing movements, which are trying to consider women or feminists. The enemy number one and well again it reminds me of my use in the countryside where people tended to say this is not for us this is for the big cities or others go these days and say it's a lifestyle topic and it's true if you talk about feminism often people say no that's not for me but when you talk about child care when you talk about the protection from violence and other things, you are talking about the life realities, and that's meant to be 
the trigger or the lever. And secondly, we need to put all these aspects in the focus. There won't be equality or equal rights as long as only a small group does feminism. So quotation systems or quota systems are good. And of course, I'm very much in favor of having more women on the boards of big corporations, but it does not change much with respect to the lives of women who work on the shop floor and then rush home in order to take care of their families. So if we really want to have an impact, we need to focus on economy, on economics and on the economy. And therefore, I'm very, very grateful for having you put the economic dimension in the focus again. And then it's also about alliances, which is what you also said. We've managed to build those alliances in the climate movement. And we need it in other fields, too. And of course, this needs to be a global alliance because lots of what we see here in the field of care work is what we would see in the South as well. I mean, it's easy to say a global alliance. And it's also easy to have an event like this one tonight. But the question is always what comes next? How do we mobilize? so that we create a pressure on the European, on the international level in order to improve the situation. So for gangs, go back to the old strategies of the feminist strategy because it has a new and modern meaning these days. In Spain, they have days off for women who suffer from menstruation problems. Can we do this here too? And then secondly, the man earns 5,000 euros and the woman stays home. And I wonder, could we make it like 50-50? So split the working time in half so that both work and stay at home. Now, these are very practical questions. Well, with respect to the menstruation days, we say we look at the situation, and I think there should be a simple way to get women a day off or days off if they suffer. If you make it a law, if you put it automatically, so to speak, this might turn into another argument against hiring women. So we decided to look at what will follow in Spain in order to then decide what to do here. But it's, of course, important to help women who suffer pain. But legal instruments, I'm not sure whether this is the way to go. I mean, can we simply split the salary and the work? Actually, this is the idea of reducing the working time. So you might have either 40 hours a week and then eight works 20, but this is, of course, problematic in other cases where you build a kind of a corridor. You still have the problem of the career perspectives and often, very often, even if a couple shares the work, 
he works more than her. So the new standard should consider that work is also when taking care of others. I mean, this is not about a wage for household work. But this is about recognizing the time you work for a community, for the society. You want to have time to get involved, to become part of a movement, of a political group or whatever. So we need a standardized working time, which gives us time to take care of ourselves and others. Jayati, yours is the final word. Well, no, thank you. I first of all just want to agree with what Ricarda just said. I think that's absolutely true. It's not about giving you know everybody a lower wage and then everybody working less. So it is about reducing work hours in total. And uh, I'm reminded now in Ecuador in the 2010s, there was a progressive government with a five-year plan that had a wonderful idea. Among the goals that it put in was an increase in relational time, time to have social relations, time to talk to other people, time to mobilize, time to visit you know, different uh, things. It's a huge part. And many women do not actually get relational time. And so I think, you know, when we're looking at time poverty, we also have to recognize that a demand for a, sm a shorter working week or a shorter working day cannot be confined to paid work alone. And which is why those five hours I've mentioned are so cru crucial. You can only reduce it when you recognize how much time is being spent. So first let's measure this. Then let's think of reducing in the different ways we can reduce it. Then let's redistribute it so that everybody has relational time, leisure time, time to live. And then, of course, we reward it and we represent those workers. So all of those, I think, are absolutely essential. The issue about, um, you know, the flexibility for women uh, who are menstruating, I, I was reminded there was a wonderful article that Gloria Steinem wrote, I think, decades ago. It's called If Men Could Menstruate. Please read it. Because, you know, it just how life would be different and how menstruation itself would be seen if men could menstruate uh, is, is quite a significant and important thing. But I do think that that means that policy also has to recognize that this is something which is, poses different costs on women. In other words, I agree, maybe a standard you know, blanket law may be counterproductive for many reasons. We know that in India, even trying to give maternity leave uh, to women for private employers meant a big reduction in the women who got employed. Mm -hmm. So we have to think of creative ways of dealing with it, but we have to recognize that this is something women go through that men don't, and that that does affect their working lives as their other lives. And so we need to find a way of factoring that into our policies and strategies, even in workplaces, even if we're not very rigid about it as a law. But finally, I just want to say, you know, this has been such a fascinating discussion. And I have to say for me also very inspiring because it's, it's very good to know that there are people who are able to make a difference in their own societies and in their governments who are actively thinking about these issues and are thinking of linking that to wider struggles in the developing world. I think for us in the developing world, it is definitely something that we, we are welcome greatly. Yeah, yeah wunderbar. Right. We have reached the end of this event. Thank you, Jayati, for having been with us. Even if it was only virtually, I did not really realize the difference, but I would have loved to have you here really real. I mean, the closeness we feel in terms of contents would be a physical one, which would be lovely. 
Ricardo, I would like to also thank you. For me, it was once again a wonderful introduction into the possibilities and also maybe the limits of what can be done if the Green Party is involved in decision-making processes. I think the debate we have had today about feminist economics helps us understand how a future society, a more just, a more equal society could be and what it means. Less working time, more relational time, not only referring to your private sphere, but also with respect to shaping societies, shaping politics, and a willingness to work for the benefit of everybody. So thank you, Jörg and Sarah, for having organized this event. Thank you for letting me be part of it. It was a pleasure. <laughs> I would like to also invite you to join you in the to, to join us in the next event of this unofficial series of events. Please check our program online and feel inspired. Thank you.